Hallelujah, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. You make all things new. You make all things new. God of mercy, God of love, do what only you can do. You make all things new. Oh, prophesy, prophesy, you make all things new. You make all Prophesy today to yourself, prophesy about what is going to happen in your life. Declare that you will rise up from the ashes, from the dust. You will rise up out of darkness into the light. You will rise up. Every dark situation is only for a season. You will rise up because though weeping is enduring for your nighttime, joy is coming in the morning. Declare it over yourself. Prophesy it over yourself. That you will rise up out of the dust, out of the darkness, out of the ashes, into the light. Out of darkness, into the light, I will rise up. I will rise up from the ashes, from the dust, I will rise up. I will rise, you may go. He makes all things, he makes all things, you make all things new. Jesus declared at the end of our age, he says, behold, I make all things new. Come on. You make all things new. Declare it, declare it, sing it to your God. He made so things new out of darkness into the light. You will rise up, you will rise up from the ashes and from the dust. You will rise up. You will rise, you, he makes all things new. God, he makes, God, he makes, God, he makes, he makes so all things. God, he makes all things new. Declare it. Prophesy over yourself. You are the son of God. We are the sons of God. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1 that Jesus has given us, those of us who believe in his name, who have received his testimony, that he has given us the right 
to be as him, to be the sons of God. And so the Bible tells us that when we are the sons of God, that God puts the word of God in us through the Holy Ghost. And that this word is the spirit. This word is spirit and it is full of power. Therefore, our words, just like God, can change things, but we must believe. This is why Revelation 12 tells us that in the, in the battle for our souls, for our lives, the way that we overcome Satan is in three ways. One, by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus made it possible to even actually overcome. Secondly, by the things that we confess, our affirmations, the things that we believe and then confess. And thirdly, laying our lives down completely for the sake of the gospel. It says that when we have these three things working for us, that we overcome Satan. The outcome is that you will overcome. God will make all things new in our lives. Revelation, the book of Revelation tells us, Jesus says, behold, I make all things new. And so everything in your life that looks like it is dead, it is dying, it is about to be moved out of the way. Understand that God is still in your life. God is still working. God is still active. God is still there. And he will make all things new. Apostle Peter tells us that after we have suffered a while, that God will come and establish us, perfect us, strengthen us, and complete us. So whatever you may be experiencing today, whatever you may be going through, know this, right? This song, All Things New by Big Daddy Weave. Hear his declaration. He says that God will make all things new. It says that out of darkness, we will rise up into the light. From the dust and from the ashes, we will rise up. God has said in the book of Isaiah that he will give us beauty for our ashes and so i know that when we look at our lives and we 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 consider the pain that we have experienced and the pain that we go through daily that it causes us to wonder my goodness is god really with me i mean am i really a son of god because there should not be this level this degree of pain in my life if god and i have a thing but on the contrary, Hebrews 11 tells us that when God receives us as sons, that we must go through a period of chastening. And this period of chastening involves a scourging. And for those of you who remember the story of, of Jesus, it says that he was scourged. And a scourge is a whip that has um, 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 sharp blades at the end of it. It, it rips flesh whenever you apply it to the body. This is what Jesus was uh, you uh, what was uh, beaten with. And for those of you who have watched the Passion of the Christ, they, they use a scourge in there to show the effect of, uh, of what it does to the body. It rips skin because it's a whip that has these uh, uh, blades attached to it. It's meant to be an agonizing punishment right that's what it is that that would be the definition of capital punishment it is so severe it is inhumane right and so the Bible tells us that every son whom God receives he scourges and many times even in my own life I have to look you know I've looked back and said you know, at the time I was going through something that, oh, you know, I can't survive this. How, how is this even love? But when I go back and in hindsight and look at the effect of what um, that, that chastening per performed in my life, I actually see, oh my goodness, it actually revealed within me a greater weight of God's glory. It revealed within me greater holiness. It revealed within me greater righteousness. The Bible says that we will learn obedience through the things that we suffer. It says that when those of us that have suffered, we cease from sin. That suffering is the means by which sin ceases, ceases to exist in your life. 
So though we may not perceive it, understand this, that God knows very much what he is doing. And all of us are precious to God. Every person that has said yes is precious to God. I think about my life before I actually got saved, before I knew or became aware of who God really was, that even then when I look back at some of the occurrences, I realized that God had always been with me. The Bible says that in Romans 8, that God foreknew us, right? And so for those that God has foreknown, which means that God and you had an ex experiential uh, or an experience before you actually became consciously aware of God and because of that God already knew what you were going to do and you were already your name was already written in the Lamb's Book of Life even though you might have been acting like a human because you did not know God God is incapable of losing any of us not good or bad people. God is incapable of losing any. God knows where we all are. And none of us are lost. All of us are precious to God, especially the sons of God. We are all precious to God. The Bible says that two sparrows, which mean nothing at all, do not fall to the ground without God seeing. How much more you, who is a son of God, who God birthed through the blood of Jesus Christ, you who are of great value, God cannot forget you. And so, although you sit in a place of pain, although you sit in a place of sorrow, know this. That God has not forgot. God has not forgot. God has not forgotten, no he didn't, no he didn't, no, God did not forget, whatever he told you, they had a motion that, that is what will come to pass, oh, he a boy, yeah. God did not forget you, Son of God, Son of God, God did not forget. Well, good morning. I am Apostle Mary Gibbs, and that's my story. Well, I welcome you today to this service yesterday, uh, not yesterday, last Sunday. We did not have service. Um, I just took a little break to spend time with my daughter. She was on um, um, spring break, so I just took a break for that week. But um, today we resume, um, and as always, it is an honor, it is a pleasure to stand before you. It gives me great pleasure. Well, let's get right into today's service. Let's bless the service by welcoming, well, God is already here. <laughs> Holy Spirit, we thank you for this time. We bless you, we magnify you. I thank you for being here. Holy Ghost, I know that you know every heart, every person who's hurting this morning. I ask you to heal them with the balm of Gilead. I ask you to strengthen them with might in their inner man so that they will not have sorrow any longer in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, every person who's on the brink of failing, brink of failing in their faith, Holy Spirit, I ask you to strengthen them so that their faith will not fail. Jesus, you have prayed for us all. And I know that your prayers do not fail. And even as you prayed that Peter would be restored, I pray that all of these, my, my, my siblings in you, that they will be converted. Their faith shall not fail, but rather they will receive within them the second wind to continue to fight. They will strengthen the, the, the feeble knees and the, and, and the things that are already looking lame. Nothing in their lives shall die except those things that are not supposed to be there. In your name, I pray, I ask you to bless this service. Let your words be a source of nourishment and encouragement to our spirits, to our souls, to ignite within us your zeal and your fire, that our faith will not fail and it will not falter in the name of Jesus. Help us to be transformed in the hearing of your word. In your name, I pray, Jesus. 
Hallelujah. Well, today, excuse me, today our, oh, what am I saying? Today I am preaching a message entitled, Fear Not, come on, Kobusha, Fear Not, O You of Little Faith. Fear Not, O You of Little Faith. Well, come with me, our main scripture is coming from Matthew 8, verses 20 to 27 and I'm reading from the New King James Version and the Bible says verse 23 now when Jesus got into the boat or into a boat the his disciples followed him and suddenly suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat that they were in Jesus and his disciples was covered with the waves <laughs> come on verse 24 again and suddenly right out of nowhere out of nowhere suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with the waves but jesus was asleep then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us! We are perishing. Come on, Kobosha. But Jesus said to them, Jesus said to them what he is saying to you this morning about this situation that you are facing that causes you to look and say, we are perishing. I am perishing. Save me. He says, Why are you fearful? Why are you full of fear? Oh, you of little faith. Come on. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Verse 27, so the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Fear not, O ye of little faith. Doesn't that describe exactly our calling, <laughs> our experience with the things of God? The Bible says that the just shall live by faith. And the Bible also tells us that faith has an element within it of invisibility. For it to be considered faith, it means that you cannot see beyond your current situation. That's what faith is. Right? Faith is a blind. Yeah. It means all you have to go on is the word of God, nothing else. But doesn't this, this describe exactly the trial of our faith, our experience as born-again believers? That we get saved and we truly believe in God. And we say, God, I will follow you wherever. <laughs> and God says, okay, come on, right? And so we get on this vehicle with Jesus Christ, this boat, whatever your boat may be, we get on this journey, and when we get on the journey, there is calm and there is peace, and we are sure that all things will work together for our good. But as we move a few steps, come on, as we do that thing that God said do, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a tempest, a trial, a shaking. The Bible describes tempest as a vehement, a violent earthquake in the waters. Right? So as we walk this walk with God, as we're in the boat with God, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we see this tornado, this hurricane brewing, this earthquake that is earth shattering, shaking everything that we know to be true, shaking the very foundations of our lives. Come on, Kobusha, a tempest. The Bible says, out of nowhere. It's not anything you did. There's no cause and effect. It's not because you sinned. It's not because of this. It's not because of that. Out of nowhere. It means that your life 
<laughs> and everything in your purpose called out to the elements of the earth to come and test you. Right? And so out of nowhere, not because you did anything, even if you were the cause of the tempest, it doesn't matter. The point is, suddenly, a situation arose in your life that causes you to say, oh my God, oh Yerebuko, oh my God, we are going to die here. The disciples came, the Bible says that the situation was so egregious that the boat began to be covered with the waves. Right? <coughs> Excuse me. The boat they were in began to be covered with the waves. Come on. So that when they looked in the natural, the thing that they surmised was this, that they were about to, be, to perish. It didn't matter that Jesus was in the boat. Come on. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it didn't matter that Jesus was in the boat. What they saw was that the situation they were in was a terrible one and it was going to cause them to perish. The sea was about to swallow them up. That's what they could see. In that moment, they could not behold that there was faith. They could not remember any of the words that Jesus told them. They couldn't remember those things that he had prophesied. Now Jesus, let's look at it from the perspective of Jesus. Jesus was on the boat, but he was asleep. <laughs> oh, I know, I mean, you know. God, you know, the way God thinks is just very different. I mean, yeah. Right? And so why? Jesus knew that none that God had given him would be lost. He knew that. So, which meant nobody was going to die today in this boat, number one. Number two, he knew that his purpose had not been fulfilled. Right? His assignment was to come unto the earth. And to get on the cross and die so his blood could pay for our sins. He knew that. So definitely, he wasn't de definitely dying in that boat, right? He wasn't. And so it didn't matter that a tempest arose. His word could shut that tempest. It could calm that tempest. His word could get rid of that tempest. So he was not troubled by it. But what he expected of the disciples was faith. He expected them in the midst of the situation to believe in God's salvation. He did not expect them to be full of fear. That word there is the word, the fear of loss, loss of whatever whether it's loss of life, loss of a partner, loss of whatever, right? He says, fearful there is the word that describes the fear of loss. To be affrighted, to be filled with dread. He said, why are you so full of fear? So this is his admonishment, ad, ad, admonishment to us all. That when a tempest arises in our lives, God does not want us to be full of fear. He wants us to reach deep within as best as we can and look for faith. But the only way you can do that is by recalling the words that God has spoken to you. The word that God has spoken to you before you entered into this place is the word that you need to recall so that you have something to anchor your hope onto. By this time in their lives, the disciples have already seen him do miracles. They have already understood that <clears throat> he is the Messiah, that he is God. 
They have already understood that they are safe with him. But the carnal mind took over in the moment of fear, and that is what happens to us all. In the moment where you perceive something where you know that you cannot overcome it on your own, we resort back to that familiar place of fearfulness. And that is the one thing God does not want us to do. He does not want us to be afraid. He does not want us to entertain the spirit of fear. Why? Because fear involves torment. We will have trials. We will have tribulations. But God does not want us to embrace fear. If you are going to re have a response, have any response other than the response of fear to that situation. And the only way to respond by faith is to be able to recall what God has said and to regurgitate, to meditate what God said and to speak back the words of God. But I know that in the moment of fear, when we're standing in front of something that can destroy us, it is difficult to call faith forward. What is easier to do is to, to, is to, is to, is to, to re-experience fear because fear is familiar. And so it is, it is, it, it is almost a defense mechanism because in the place of uncertainty, in the place of trouble, we are looking for something that is comforting. Though fear is terrible, it is a familiar place and things that are familiar give us comfort even though they are bad for us. Right? This is why we return to bad behavior, bad relationships, bad habits, addictions, things of that nature. Why? Even though we know it is good for us, it is a place of familiarity. It is a comfort zone and comfort zones always trigger a false sense of security. So we go back to that place. And so the emotion that we are most comfortable with, the emotion we are most secure with is fear. And so we return to the place of fear because it triggers a false sense of security. At least if I'm afraid, I'm aware that there is danger and I can somehow figure a way to save myself. But all those are false narratives. Fear can help you. The only thing that fear can do is fear can destroy the faith that you have, destroy the power of your faith, and fear releases torment in your soul. So it may be a place of familiarity, but it is a place that we should run far away from as quickly as we can. So Jesus says, I don't want you to be afraid. When you're looking at a situation and you say, Lord, what shall I do? God is telling you, the first thing you should do is do not be afraid. Because if you're not afraid, then you can think with a clear head. When you're not afraid, you can summon up the courage to call forth faith to come and help you. You can sum up the courage to speak the words of God into your situation because that's the only thing that will save you, the word of God. The truth is that when we became born again, the Holy Spirit came upon us. And the Holy Spirit is always with us. And so though we may not see the Holy Spirit, God is always with us in our situation. But because he is not tangibly touched, we forget. But we are not alone. That is the truth. God is with us always. That is the truth. We are not orphans. Right? But we forget because we see the tempest and we say, well, where's God? <laughs> Where is God? But God is always with us, always. Let's go to Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 2, verses 5 and verses 16 through 19, verses Isaiah 43, 
verses 1 to 2. Well, let's do Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2, and verse 5 for now. Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2, and verse 5. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, because I have bought you back. Right? I've redeemed you. You belong to me. You, you, you no longer are your own. You no longer belong to Satan. You no longer belong to the world. You no longer belong to self. You no longer belong to parents. You no longer belong to uh, ch uh, children. You no longer belong to siblings. You no longer belong to spouses. You belong to me. You no longer belong to the grip of Satan. You belong to me. He says, Fear not. Don't be afraid. I have redeemed you. Whatever you do, don't be afraid. Whatever your situation is, if you hear nothing else that I say, hear this. Don't be afraid. Decide that you will not be afraid so that you can remain level-headed. I know it's difficult because that would be like standing in front of a beast, a, like a wild animal, like a lion, and then <laughs> you know that, okay, only two outcomes can occur. One outcome is this thing will jump on you and maul you and just take your life, or the second is by some miraculous power of God, this animal will flee. But God says, no matter what is standing in front of you, I don't want you to be afraid. So for you who is saying, Lord, what should I do? God is saying, I don't, don't be afraid. That's what I want you to do. Do not be afraid. Okay? Okay. Fear not. For I have bought you back. I have called you by your name. You are mine. You belong to me. Right? I'm not just going to abandon you. You belong to me. Verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, right? So disciples, you're in the waters right now, you're in the ocean, right? But this is what God says. When you pass through these oceans, when you pass through this tempest that is covering your, your boat with the waves, I will be with you. And we saw it physically occur with the Israel, with the disciples. Jesus was physically there. And though he was physically there, they were still afraid. It didn't matter. So in the same way Jesus was physically there in that boat with them, is the same way that Jesus is here physically here with us through the Holy Ghost who is inside of us. Nothing is different between your situation now and what the, uh, the, 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 come on, the disciples experienced in the boat with Jesus there with them. We are in the same exact situation. And just as Jesus was there physically with them and it didn't matter, the Holy Spirit is with us physically and it seems to not matter. So it doesn't matter if the person is physically in front of you or not. What matters is truth. The truth is God was with them there in the boat, the truth physically, and the truth is God is with us now physically in the boat. And he says, when you are in the boat and you are in the midst of the ocean and you are passing through, what does he say? You are passing through the waters I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. Although the waves are crashing over your boat, come on, Kobosha. Although the waves are crashing over your boat, I'm not going to let you perish. I know it looks like that, but the end of this thing for you is not death, but the glory of God. This situation you're in is not unto death, Lazarus, but for the glory of God. Even though Lazarus did perish for three days, right, or four days, however many days it was, he still, he still did not end dead. God is the master of the sea. You know that? So he says when you are in the 
waters, the oceans. I'm the master of the sea. Nothing is going to I will not let anything happen to you. So don't look at what you're seeing. Don't look at what your natural is feeding you. Don't look at the information it's feeding you. Don't look at that. Put your eyes on me. Put your eyes on Jesus. Hillsong, Hillsong, I believe, has a song that says, Oceans Rise. And it says, When oceans rise, I will... I forget how it goes. Something about, when oceans rise, I will fix my eyes above the, the waves. Because I am yours. I will call upon your name. Fix my eyes above the waves when oceans rise. Right? Spirit, lead me where my trust is without border. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me farther than my feet could ever wander where my trust is without borders in the presence of my Savior. I will call upon your name when oceans rise. Fix my eyes above the waves when oceans rise. When oceans rise, I will call upon the name. I will fix my eyes above the waves when oceans rise. All of us, at one time or another in our Christian walk, will be immersed in an ocean. We will be, not a physical one, but we will be immersed in a spiritual ocean, in one place, point, in our lives or the other. We will experience, we will have an oceanic experience, a place where our boat, our vehicle is lodged within an ocean that we cannot traverse on our own. And when we look, it really looks as if we will die there. But God says, no. Do not be afraid because I am there with you in that ocean. He says, when you go through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Nor shall the flame scorch you. Verse 5, fear not. That means to be affrighted, to make afraid. Fear not, for I am with you. Let's read verse 16. Let's read verse 16 through verse 19 because I was going to come back to this later, but it's important that we understand what God is saying about the ocean. God is the master of the sea, which means that God is the master of any situation that you are currently traversing. Verse 16 says, Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters. Come on, come on. It means that God is experienced in dealing with tumultuous things that happen in the sea. Come on. God is, is experienced at manipulating the waters. Come on. He has experience in that area. <laughs> Whether it is the physical waters of the ocean or the physical waters of your trial, God has experience with manipulating oceanic bodies. And so verse 16 says, Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea. God has the ability to manipulate the waters. 
He has an ability to manipulate every trial and tribulation we will ever experience or know. It says that he makes a path through the mighty waters. Verse 17. It is that same God who brings forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They shall not rise. They are extinguished. They are quenched like a wick. There is something that I want you to understand about your tempest, about this body of water that you are immersed in right now. Your situation has an enemy that needs to be drowned. Come on. You have to figure out what that enemy is. Whenever a tempest arises in our life, there is an enemy that comes with it. What that enemy does not understand is this, that God is leading that, drawing that enemy out. <laughs> Come on. God is using you as a bait so that the enemy would be drawn out after you and God can kill it there. Kobo Shanda. Come on. This is why the Bible says, when we go to Exodus 14, the Bible is very clear. God says to Moses, he says, listen, I want you to purposefully leave the children of Israel by the way of the Red Sea. Come on, the body of water. Come on, right? Because when they get there, their enemy, the Pharaoh, Egypt, is going to think that they have become hemmed in. Come on. This is what Satan thinks is happening to you when the devil releases a tempest after you. The devil thinks that you are going to be drowned by that situation. The devil thinks that he is going to kill you there. What Satan doesn't understand is that God is drawing him out by using you as a bait. And so when your enemy comes after you, your tempest now becomes the place of their grave. God drew out Egypt by leading Israel to the tempest, to the sea. And God, because God now manipulates oceanic bodies, come on, he's the master of the sea, he says, uh -huh, this shall become the grave of the devil that is chasing you up and down the place. And so when you look at your situation, oh, Sharababa, oh, Ramandebe Kesieke, come on. God has a plan. He's up to something. He's about to destroy the army and the chariot that has been chasing you for all of these years. Oh, yeah, 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 Just be still so that you can see the salvation of God. The Bible says that God makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters. He brings forth the chariot and the horse, the army and the power. Listen what he says. He draws them out, <laughs> right? He uses you as a bait to draw them out. <laughs> oh my gosh, Satan did not understand that when he, when he would, um, when he would, influence Israel to to crucify Jesus that <laughs> that that tempest in the life of Jesus was the mechanism through which Satan's dominion was going to be taken from him the devil did not understand that that's why he went ahead and said yes crucify him Satan didn't understand that if they understood, they would not have done that. And what's funny is that the devil continues to fall into the same trap over and over and over and over and over. The tempest is used as a place where God kills your enemy. The tempest is the place where your enemy is destroyed. But your enemy doesn't know that. 
Your enemy just thinks, oh, well, I'm going to give you trouble in your life. But your enemy doesn't know that the storm that they are brewing in your life is going to become that pit they have dug for you is the thing, it becomes their own grave. They didn't know that they were digging up their own grave. They did not understand it. Oh, Rabashikindi. That tempest becomes the grave of your oppressor. Right? It becomes the grave of your oppressor. When we go back to Matthew 8 verses 23 uh, verses verses 26 and 27 it says but Jesus said to them why are you fearful O you of little faith then he arose and he rebuked the winds and the sea and there was a great calm you are in a boat you are in a situation with somebody who has the ability to speak a word and change everything that will happen in your life. But you have to remember and believe it as truth. That the power of the Holy Spirit, you see, the same Holy Spirit that seems to be silent or actually not even there, is the same Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead. But we don't think about it. We don't consider that there is power within us through the Holy Ghost. We don't think about it at all. Right? But the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same one that is living in you and I today. I think about my suicide from 2004 every single time. I should not be here. Right? And when I did it, I wasn't considering God was with me. And I definitely didn't ask God to raise me back up from the dead. I didn't do that. But God sent me back. God raised me up. And that is truth. Right? God did that on his own. Right? I didn't pray, come and save me, no. Because God is able to save us from every situation. Every single situation. And so, in verse 27, the Bible says, So the men... Matthew 8, 27, the Bible says, So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? Who is this that your situation obeys him? When God speaks a word over your situation, it obeys him. But that word that God speaks is the same word in your mouth and in your heart. You now have to work at your confidence in speaking that word. The Bible tells us in Romans 10 that faith comes by hearing the word of God. You have to hear the word of God for faith to come. The Bible says faith comes by hearing the word of God. Your enemy is going to perish in the storm that he has brewed in your life. Your trial, your tribulation, the tempest, the shaking that is happening in your life. Something will be swallowed up whole in it and it's not going to be you. A sacrifice is being made. An offering is being made and that offering is not you. It is your enemy. Something will die in the place of your tempest. But it will be your enemy. Your fear. The thing that has tormented you for years. The thing that has chased you and tried to keep you bound. Whatever it is has been keeping you bound is the thing that is going to be swallowed up whole in your situation. That's the entire purpose of this. Of you entering into a place with God where a tempest arises. Because God has a plan to destroy your enemy in that place. 
Whatever it is that has held you bound, that is what shall be destroyed in the place of your tempest. And so in verse 18, Isaiah 43 verse 18 and 19, God says, Your enemy is extinguished, they are quenched like a wick. They will not rise again. Verse 18, therefore, do not remember the former things. Behold, I will do a new thing. This morning, just before I, I came out to preach, this song, All Things New by Big Daddy Weave, um, it just came into my spirit. God is doing a new thing. He's doing a new thing. He's going to make all things new. He makes all things new. You make all things new. You make all Now it shall spring up, verse 19, Isaiah 43, verse 19. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? Can't you see it? He says, I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Through this tempest, through this situation, you are going to see a new thing happen in your life. God is about to do a new thing for us all. Stand with hope and expectation for the new thing that God is doing in your life. Behold, he is doing a new thing and it will spring forth in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for these, your sons and your daughters. I thank you, the Holy Ghost, for giving us faith, new faith that we are converted, that we are strengthened with might in our inner man. I thank you, Father, for these that you are doing in our life even now. I thank you, Holy Spirit. Do your new thing. Help us believe for your new thing. Help us stand with hope and expectation for your new thing. Help us know with, this, with certainty that this demon, this tempest, this enemy that we are facing, we will see no longer. As Moses said to the children of Israel, this enemy, that you see today, you will see no more. Also, this enemy that we see today, we will see no more in the name of Jesus. God will destroy this enemy here. God will destroy this tempest here in the name of Jesus Christ. God will destroy this thing through the tempest. Your trial, your tribulation, the thing that is causing you fear, don't let it be a, make you afraid because God shall destroy your fear through it. God shall destroy everything that chases you, that causes you to have fear, that causes you to feel bondage. God will destroy through your situation. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. Perhaps you don't know this Jesus Christ that I'm talking about today. I want you to know without him, I would not be here today in 2004. I did commit suicide. That is not a lie. Um, and God raised me back 12 hours after I did it. And when I came to, I threw up the pills right after 12 hours and 
you know yes I had some loss of memory after that I began to experience loss of memory after that but that really was the only thing that remained in my life as a reminder of what I had done. I didn't ask God to raise me up. I didn't ask God to, to, to save me. None of that. I was in a place where, though I was born again, I was broken. I was hurt. I was disillusioned by God. But God by himself, without my intervention, saved me. And, and that is what God is about. God is about saving us all. God does not want any one of us to die. God loves us that much. But you have to do your own part if, if you are going to experience God. Because the one thing that God has given all of us is free will. God invites you to come and have this eternal life. God invites you to come and enter into a relationship with him but you have to make that choice for yourself you this is not something a parent a friend a spouse nobody can do for you you must want it truly for yourself and if that is you today if you truly want to experience God if you truly want to begin this journey that will take you to places that your brain cannot even imagine then I want you to do this I want you to believe in your heart, believe this message that Jesus Christ really did come as a human being on the earth, that he was born through a virgin woman by the power of this same Holy Ghost that is going to enter into you once you become born again, and that this Jesus Christ had pure blood, the only pure blood that ever existed on the face of this universe, and that this pure blood was spilled on the cross in Israel, in Jerusalem, so that the spilling of that blood would become the atonement, the payment that God would receive for sin. Which means that now you don't have to pay for your own sin. You only have to receive the payment that Jesus made for you on the cross by accepting his free gift. That's it. So if that is you today, I want you, if you truly believe that in your heart, only if you believe it, not because I'm telling you believe it, if you truly believe it, then I want you to confess what you believe. Tell God that you do believe it. Say it in your own words if you like. Say, I believe you, God. I want what Jesus died to give me. Forgive me for these my sins. Come into my life. I want a relationship. Speak to God. There is no formal formula or anything. You say it however you're feeling it. So you can say it in your own words or you can repeat after me. It's really up to you. But if you repeat after me, you must believe what you're repeating. That is the key. Salvation can only come if you believe it. If you're just mouthing words, you're, not, you're wasting your time. So don't bother. So you must believe the thing that you're about to confess. All right, so if you're ready, say it with me. Heavenly Father, I come to you today asking you to forgive me for every sin. Lord Jesus, come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Lead me. Guide me. And make me your own. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, if that was you, you are officially a born again, and I want to be the first as your sister to welcome you into the family of Christ. Um, Father, you know who have given their lives to you. I ask you to send them to a Bible-believing, Bible-based church where they will be able to grow in your love and admonition. Holy Spirit, I ask you to keep them from wolves in sheep clothing but send them to a place of love where they can be discipled. In your name I pray. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, as usual, it was an honor, a pleasure, a blessing to be here with you today. And I thank God for us all. Um, well, I believe this is the last weekend of March. So the next time we meet will be the first week in April, God willing. 
Um, so until then, stay safe, be blessed, and may the grace of God be with us all. In Jesus' name, amen.